If you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 12. We're going to be reading uh, from there and studying from there and paying particular attention to the phrase, the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. And before we launch into it, I want to just say on a personal note, today for me is an important day. May 1st, 1987, I was... uh, Very young at the time. I'm not going to say how young, but I was baptized, immersed into Christ on uh, May 1st, 1987 uh, by a plain spoken, and I don't know if there's any other kind, Alabamian preacher uh, who preached so plainly and so simply, who helped me come to a knowledge of Christ and come to faith. And of course, when you set out on a journey... A journey of following Christ or any journey, you don't know where you're going to end up. And there's certainly places that I've been that I don't uh, recommend or that I didn't plan on going. And, uh, but I'm glad that my steps have led to Lindsley Avenue and that I get to be with you guys on the Lord's Day to worship God, to serve Him in this place. And so it's an honor to be with you guys here at Lindsley Avenue. I just want to say that on a personal uh, note, um, how wonderful you guys are and how much I love you and how important this place is to me. So John chapter 12, and, and today I'm going to talk a little bit about memories. And what are some things that stimulate memory? Well, scientists say that probably the most powerful thing, and whether you know it or not, It's your sense of smell. In fact, 70% of your emotional memories are triggered by your sniffer, by what you smell. And think about it. Can you imagine, can you remember with me something in your past that has to do with a scent or a fragrance? I remember as a boy... When I was just a little boy hearing my grandmother cook in the kitchen, and I'll tell you what, that bacon that she cooked, it smelled so good, and it smells different than any other bacon that I've ever smelled since. But when I smell bacon, I kind of think back to my grandmother, who I called mother. And think about that, those memories that are spurred by the sense of smell. Think about coffee, the wonderful smell of coffee. Think about a fresh cut lawn. Doesn't that spur memories of your childhood when you were playing or your father pushing that mower in the yard, sweating? What about clean linen? That's a nice smell, isn't it? Helps you go to bed at night, don't it? When you got fresh linen, fresh sheets on your bed, boy, that just feels good when you crawl up in that bed and it smells so good. And I know probably none of you have ever been romantically inclined towards somebody and remembered a fragrance of someone that you dated or someone you loved or your wife, your husband. There's something about their aroma, their smell, their fragrance that inclines our memory, that makes us remember. I like the smell of old books. Just opening up an old book. I like the smell of old churches. When I came into Lindsley Avenue years ago, I took one nice smell. I thought, this smells like some of those good old rural churches back home. Felt like home. That sense of smell. It's so strong. Think about the scent of a baby. Boy, if that doesn't make you happy, at least most of the scents that a baby puts off. But that clean smelling baby, boy, it's just a beautiful thing, isn't it? There's nothing like it. You probably remember the smell of crayons, don't you? You don't have to have a crayon in front of you to know what a crayon smells like, do you? Oh, here's everybody's favorite smell, that new car. So elusive for most of us, but boy, it smells so good. And that smell, that new car smell goes away in just six weeks. And probably if you're getting in the car every day, It goes away quicker than that because your sense of smell becomes used to it. That new car smell. 
What about an old leather jacket or something like that? There's these strong smells, these scents that spur our memory. And our sense of smell is powerful. It has a power of, powerful effect on our psyche, on our memory, on our mind. Here's some interesting facts about your sense of smell. Your scent cells are renewed every 28 days. So every month, you essentially get a new nose. Smell is the most accurate of the senses in remembering that your recall with your nose is 65%, whereas your eyes are about 50%. So maybe we need some nose witnesses instead of eyewitnesses. All right, Steve? Your sense of smell is the first sense you develop. Even before you're born, you have your sense of smell fully functioning. And... Ladies, your sense of smell is stronger than men. We probably knew that. And most, because most of us men forget that we smell so badly. And the human brain can process roughly 10,000 smells. This is amazing. 10,000 smells just in the area the size of a postage stamp. That's how, small, that's how strong your nose is. And what are we talking about when we talk about the sense of smell? We're talking about perception, aren't we? You're perceiving a reality. And really, that's what faith is, isn't it? Faith is a perception of the way things are. It's an awareness, isn't it? And so when we compare things to spiritual things, faith is one of those perceptions. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It's being aware that there is a God. It's being aware that there is a thing called love. It is being aware that there's more to life than what we see, what we hear, what we smell. Paul said it like this, But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. You see, there are realities of faith There are spiritual realities that are only perceived through spiritual pursuits, through faith. And so today I want us to think about the spiritual application of scent. And look at John chapter 12 with me. Verse 1, Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus, who had been dead, whom He had raised from the dead, There they made him a supper, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Think about this pivotal time in the life of Jesus. This is a week, essentially, before he's crucified. He's in the town of Bethany. The next day he will venture into Jerusalem. He will have his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. And this is the night before. This is the night before He goes to Jerusalem. The night before He goes into that town where where He will eventually be crucified. And He's eating supper. He's having dinner with His friends. In the book of Mark, it tells us that He is in the house of Simon the leper. He's not in Mary and Martha's house. He's not in Lazarus' house. He's at Simon the leper's house. Now, I want to first tell you, too, that there are two incidences within the Gospels to where Jesus is anointed by a woman. And there's two of them. There's one that's recorded in Luke, which is called the anointing of the sinful woman. And then there is this second incident where it is Mary who anoints Jesus. And the book of John tells us specifically her name, whereas Mark and Matthew do not. So, Matthew, Mark, and John record the incident of Mary anointing Jesus. Just think about eating supper with someone that had been in the grave. Think about that. Do you have someone that you know that has passed? Think about being with them days later after they've been dead and buried, and here you're getting to eat supper with them. That's what Mary and Martha, their brother who was dead in the grave, 
is now sitting at the table with them, eating. And they're in the house of Simon, the leper, who had been healed by Jesus. He was no longer a leper. Just like Lazarus was no longer dead. But here they were, sitting at the table. What's interesting, too, is that where do you find Martha? What's she doing? She's serving. What do you find her doing in Luke chapter 10? Well, she says she's distracted by serving. Remember that story? Where she's serving so many people, and then where's Mary at? Mary's down at the feet of Jesus, and Martha kind of gets upset with her, and she looks over to Jesus and says, Hey, my sister doesn't even help me. We got so many chores to do. We got dirty dishes. We got food. I got to get all this stuff out. And where's Mary? She's not helping me. And what does Jesus say? But one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. Isn't it neat that the Gospels, the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of John, say the same thing? about Martha, that she was serving. This was her custom. She was serving in Luke chapter 10. And in John chapter 12, what's she doing? She's serving the household. Think about Mary. When Jesus had come just a few days before, she was emotionally distraught, wasn't she? When Jesus found them in the town of Bethany, when He found Martha, when He found Mary... Mary said this to Jesus, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would have not died. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in his spirit, and he was troubled. Think about that. How hopeless Martha was and Mary were just days before this, that their brother was dead. And in fact, what did it say about Lazarus in the grave? It said something about how he smelled, didn't it? Now, I only tell you this because the Scriptures say it said that Lazarus was in the grave and he stinketh. But the smell is going to be different tonight at supper. Not only, I'm sure, was the food smelling good, but Mary does something so sublime, so beautiful that His disciples don't know what to think. Look at verse 3. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped His feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of oil. So this oil that Mary had, this oil of spikenard, it's pure nard is what it says. And this was imported from India. This grew in the mountains of the Himalayas. And now she was applying it to Jesus' feet and head and washing His feet, anointing His feet with this costly, beautiful oil. And can you imagine the smell that happened in this room, in this house? Here they were, they'd probably gotten done with dinner, and now Mary broke out this alabaster flask of all this expensive, in fact it says 300 denarii, which was a year's wages. And she broke it open and poured it on His feet. What a beautiful act of reverence. And it says pure nard. Isn't that what we are to be? As Christians, as followers of Christ, to be pure in His sight. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows and their afflictions and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. In fact, oil was something, costly oil, was something that was used on the priest in the Old Testament days. In the book of Exodus, it gives this formula for the oil that they would anoint the priest. And in fact, it says in verse 32 of Exodus 30 that it shall not be poured on man's flesh, nor shall you make any other like it according to its composition. It's holy, and it shall be holy to you. There was this special formula of all that the priest would receive in anointing. In fact, 
The great writer A.W. Tozer said this, The fragrance of the anointing oil was so unique, if someone was near an Old Testament priest, he would say immediately, I smell an anointed man. I smell the holy oil, the aroma, the pungency, the fragrance were there. Such an anointing could not be kept a secret. And isn't that the way that Christ, His indwelling, His morality, His will is to be in our lives? That when people come in contact with us, they sense the anointing of the Holy Spirit. They sense that we too are His priests. Peter said that ye are a royal priesthood, a holy nation in 1 Peter 2.9. John says, but you have an anointing from the Holy One. And you know all things in 1 John 2, verse number 20. There is a purity to which Mary gives to Jesus. Number two, what else do you see in this? You see the priority of Jesus. Here Jesus is in this home. And she, once again, Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken away from her. Jesus said, after she does this in the book of Mark, Assuredly, I say to wherever the gospel is preached throughout the whole world, what this woman did will be spoken of her as a memorial to her. It was a great act of faith and worship to Jesus. But guess what? It didn't come without controversy. Whenever you give your best, to Jesus, there's going to be those who detract from it. When you give your best, when you give your life to Christ, when you give the very best to Him, there are going to be some who say, wait a minute. And that's what happened to Mary. Here she gives this act of obedience. She gives this act to Jesus. And what do they say? Why, you're wasting it. And it it singles out Judas. Look at verse 4. Then one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Then he said, Not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief in the money box, and he used to take what was put in it. Think about that if you're Jesus. And you know what's ahead of you in the week. You know who's going to sell you out for just 30 pieces of silver, right? Was was Judas really interested in the poor? Or was he interested in the money? You see, his mind was on the money because his mind was on the money. It wasn't on the poor. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some have coveted after, they have erred from the faith and they have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Judas, in his heart, had already left Christ. He had already began to thieve. He didn't care about the poor. He stole himself from the poor. And now he looked over to Mary, who was worshiping Christ with this costly oil, and said, Hey, what about the poor people? No matter what, when we're followers of Jesus, there's going to be those who criticize us and those who aren't really thinking about the poor. There are those who aren't really thinking about Christ. But Jesus says in verse 7, Let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. Maybe because Mary sat at Jesus' feet so intently, She knew what was ahead of Jesus when He went to Jerusalem. What's interesting is the fragrance. In verse 3, it says, And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. You see, that smell, that scent, that fragrance persevered. And it blessed all who were in the house, including Judas, didn't it? And really, that's who we are. In 2 Corinthians, Paul says this, Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ 
and through us diffuses the fragrance of His knowledge in every place. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. Just as that fragrance entered the house and filled the house and everyone knew what had happened and what was in the air, we are to be the fragrance. We are to be that powerful scent in this world to God. And it's through us that God diffuses the knowledge of Christ to the world. And when people around us, they will sense that we have been around Christ. Because we are like Him. We smell like Him. His aroma, His fragrance is on us just like the aroma that Mary shared with Jesus Himself. Paul said, And walk in love as Christ also loved us and given Himself as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. When people around you Do they sense Jesus? Do they perceive Jesus in you? Following Jesus means that it's just as implicit as a scent and explicit as a scent. That when people come in contact with you, they come in contact with the very nature and nurture of Christ. That they sense Jesus in you. Something as subtle as a fragrance. What a beautiful challenge it is for us to fill this room with the fragrance of the oil of Christ. What a blessing it is for us to fill this world with this fragrance. Are you following Jesus? The Bible says to lay down everything for Him, to believe in Him, to believe in His words to be led by Him, to follow in His steps. It takes work sometimes. It's not always easy. The path is crooked. The path is less taken. But Christ is with us all along the journey. The Bible says to repent of our sins, to turn from them and to walk with Jesus, to confess Him to be the Son of the living God and to be immersed into His body, the church, for the remission of our sins and obedience to Him. Maybe you are a Christian, but that fragrance isn't in your life and you need prayer. Or maybe you need healing. If you need anything, this church will stand with you. Won't you come now as together we stand and as we sing?